we're in the book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter 12 tonight. So be turning there while I do a little review of what we've talked about in the last couple of weeks. Last couple of weeks we talked about uh, Peter's vision and Cornelius' vision. They had the vision at the same time. Cornelius was a, um, a, a Gentile uh, centurion, a, a Roman uh, military leader, and he would have been what they call the first uh, Gentile conversion. <coughs> but anyway, Peter had, had a vision to go to uh, Cornelius' house, and at the same time, uh, Cornelius had this vision to send people to pick up Peter and leave him there. It all worked out. Peter got there, and Cornelius received Christ as Lord and Savior, and so did his whole family. Well, in chapter 11, Peter goes back, and he gets jumped on right away by the, uh, the circumcised believers, which would have been the uh, Jewish people who had accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, but they were still holding on to the uh, law of Judaism somewhat. And they got on Peter about sharing the gospel with the Gentile man. Anyway, Peter went on to explain to them about his vision, and the Holy Spirit was with them, and they saw the light. And they realized that God had extended His grace, not only to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. So, they accepted that and were happy about it. And now we're on the road to seeing more and more Gentiles being saved. So that leads us up into chapter 12 where we're going to focus on Peter and a little bit on James. Uh, not the half-brother of Jesus, but the brother of John. Uh, James would have been one of Jesus' inner circle. His three guys that were his inner circle, uh, Peter, James, and John. They got to do things with Jesus that none of the rest of them uh, got to do. They went to several places with Jesus that the other apostles didn't get to go. So they're known as the inner circle for Jesus. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start reading and then I'm going to explain to you a few things about a Herod. A Herod. If you hear about King Herod all in the New Testament and it can get confusing because you hear about one King Herod dying and then the next uh, chapter, another chapter two, you see another king here alive, and you say, what in the world? I thought he died. So I'm going to explain all that to you and how that works. So let's go. Chapter 12, I always use the NIV version, so that's what I'll be reading out of. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, Put to death with the sword. So we see the very first apostle, one of the twelve original apostles, being put to death. The very first one. When he saw this, that this met with the approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So, we're talking here about King uh, uh, Herod Agrippa I. Now, let me explain to you about Herods. The word Herod appears in the New Testament like we would understand the word Caesar, or say in America we have the word president. We've had, what, 24 presidents so far, I think? 45 presidents? Oh, we're really only 44. So, the last one don't count. We've had 45 presidents, and the word president is something that we recognize as a somewhat of a king or a leader of a nation, okay? Well, the word Herod means the same thing. It's the king or leader of a nation. So, in the New Testament, there's four Herods mentioned. Four different ones mentioned. First, you got Herod the Great. Y'all remember anything about Herod the Great? Early in the New Testament, when Jesus was a baby. Right, right. Herod the Great uh, murdered Bethlehem's boys. He uh, had heard that uh, there was a king born. He had met with the, the, 
Magi, I think it was, and, and he had sent them to go find this king, this baby, and, uh, and he expected them to share his location with him. And the whole time, he, he told them he was just going to go work for him. The whole time he was going to kill him. He couldn't stand the thought of somebody being above him or taking charge of the Jewish nation. So, anyway, he was the one that uh, murdered the Bethlehem's boys. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Herod the Great. Uh, Herod the Great was a evil person. Look, all the Herods were evil leaders. All of them evil leaders. But he was a great builder. Uh, if you remember, he remodeled. He did some remodeling on the temple to try to gain uh, more favor with the Jews to get on their side more. Uh, that way he could be a better leader for them, a better king. Uh, he did several building projects around Jerusalem. Some of them, you can still see the ruins of them still today. But, uh, he married ten times. Herod the Great married ten times. But he was so evil, he killed several of his wives. Uh, he even killed some of his sons. Yes. And there was a saying in Rome that went like this. And it was safer to be Herod's pig than one of his sons. So he wow. was... He was mean. He was evil. Um, he, uh, when he was close to his death, and we're going to look at how he died tonight. But when he was on his deathbed, he uh, he ordered all the notable notable citizens in Jerusalem to be put in prison, and upon his death to be executed, because he knew that no one in Jerusalem would shed a tear over him, but there would be mourning in Jerusalem over the notable citizens that got executed upon his death. So there would be some more. That's how sick this man was. Very sick man. But uh, that was the first Herod mentioned in the Bible. We see him early on when Jesus was a, uh, a child. And uh, next we hear about Herod Antipas, Antiochus. Herod Antiochus. He was involved in Jesus' trial and also the execution of John the Baptist. Y'all remember Herodias, uh, his wife, that ordered the uh, head of John the Baptist to be cut off. And third, we hear about Herod Agrippa I. That's the Herod we're talking about tonight. Herod Agrippa I. Uh, he, he murdered the Apostle James that we just read about. He murdered the very first uh, Apostle out of the twelve that got killed, was murdered by his order. By Herod Agrippa the first. Then we have, lastly but not leastly, Herod Agrippa the second. He was one of Paul's judges. Um, we'll, we'll read more about him as we get, I think, in chapter 22 or 23 of Acts. We'll hear about Herod Agrippa the second. Uh, Herod Agrippa the first was the son of Aristobulus. Aristobulus, who was the son of Herod the Great. Uh, Herod the Great actually murdered Aristobulus, but before he murdered him, Aristobulus had a son, which came to be Herod Agrippa the First. Um, he was the grandson of Herod the Great, and like I just told you, Herod the Great killed. That was one of his sons that he murdered. Uh, one day he. Herod the Great just was in a bad mood that day and he killed one of his wives that day just because he was in a bad mood. After he got to feel a little better, he felt bad about it and decided to build a monument in, uh, in honor of her. So, very sick, sick family, the Herods. Uh, let me tell you how the Herods come about. Y'all remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You remember Jacob's twin son? Who was it? Esau. Remember Jacob and Esau? Uh, it said the older would serve the younger. And Jacob actually got the uh, the blessing from Isaac and carried the lineage on to, uh, to King David and on to Jesus. Uh, Esau also had a kingdom. And this is where Herod's come from. They were called the Idumans, Idumans, the 
kingdom of Adamania, Adamania, the kingdom of Adamania, the Adamans. That was Esau's kingdom, and that's where these Herods uh, descended from, from Esau. So we don't hear much about Esau after, you know, all that. Uh, he lost his birthright and stuff, but um, anyway, he did end up building a kingdom. God gave him a kingdom, but it turned out to be an evil kingdom. Uh, the hair has come from that. So now we got to move on and talk about John's death. John's death. Now, I mean James's death, I'm sorry. I got a question for you. We just read that James died and he would have been beheaded, most likely. And Peter lived. Did you think that was fair? Why did James have to die? Why, right when he was prime in his uh, Christianity, a great leader, uh, just on fire for the Lord, and had many more good things that he could have done in his life, he had to die and Peter had to live. Do you think that's fair? And why do you suppose that Jesus took him early and left Peter behind? Have you ever thought about stuff like that? potential person like that and so much good left in them. Uh, young too. They were young. You know, they weren't that old. Somebody, you know, have you ever known anybody like that? Just on fire from the Lord and so much potential to do good in the world and, and they're taken early and you just wonder why? Why? You know what? I wondered that too. And I, I got my mind just started saying, why? Why did this happen to happen? And I found a verse that satisfied my curiosity. And I want to share that verse with you. It's found over, that's just a couple verses, three of them. It's found over in Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 through 7. Listen closely to this. And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed with sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouth and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have the power to shut the heavens so that it will not rain during this time. They are prophesying in the power to turn the wars into blood and strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now, verse 7, listen to this. Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast comes up from the abyss and will attack them, overpower, and kill. When they have finished their testimony. That was the answer I got from the Lord. James had finished his testimony. Seth was that. The Lord had used him up to the point where he wanted him to be, and he took him home. We see death as a loss a lot of times, and it's natural. That's the carnal nature to mourn over a loved one that dies. But think about it. They beat us to heaven. They beat us to heaven. What a glorious time James is having right now, you know, in heaven. When he had finished his testimony, God took him to heaven. That's the answer I got, and that's the answer that satisfied me. When you see someone pass that has so much potential left, uh, so much good to share with the world, <coughs> so much witness, so much testimony, and you wonder why, it's because I had finished your testimony. You, outside of doing something stupid, are, I feel like you're, we're bulletproof until we have finished our testimony. We're not leaving this earth under no circumstances until we have finished our testimony. God says do not put me to foolish tests. I, I know you can go out there and leave here and shoot yourself in the head. But outside of doing foolish things to put in God the foolish test, you are bulletproof until God is through with you. As simple as that. You're not going anywhere until God is through with you. Let's talk about Peter. 
Peter, as you know through the New Testament, Peter had a mouth. He often stuck his sandal in his mouth too much. He said too much sometimes. He, he was arrogant sometimes. He was boastful sometimes. He was proud sometimes. Petrus. He was basically a big mouth. Petrus. Pardon? Impetuous. Yeah. He had his ways, and Jesus loved him to pieces. Jesus loved, Jesus loved him. Jesus loved to correct him, too. Remember when he saw him get behind him, Satan? Uh, Peter had his ways, but Peter turned out to be a wonderful pastor, Christian leader. You remember, he was the one who gave the first sermon. 3,000 plus people gave their life to Christ. Peter was a powerful pastor, a powerful leader. What it takes to be a person like Peter is to lead by example. A good leader like Peter will go do the jobs that nobody else wants to do. He will go do them first. He will lead by example, and that's exactly what he did. What do you think he was doing when he got himself arrested? He was preaching the gospel, leading by example. He was out there in the streets preaching, in the synagogues, preaching. And he didn't care about his life. He didn't care one bit if he died. And they got him arrested. Now he's in jail, being guarded by 16 different soldiers, four soldiers per shift. They would have been on six-hour shifts. Every six hours they would change. Four more new one fresh would come in. Chain, one on each side, one chain to him here, one chain to him here. Several at the gate. So, in other words, he wasn't going anywhere. He was guarded heavily. He had already escaped prison one time, and they said, it ain't going to happen again. We are guarding him heavily. Now, Peter is going to be killed the next day. He's going to be beheaded the very next day. How do you suppose Peter felt that last night on earth? When he, how do you suppose he slept his last night on earth? Bobby didn't sleep tonight? I think he was asleep. Yeah? I don't think so. Yeah, he might have been. How do y'all think, think he slept good? Or you think he probably didn't sleep? I don't you know what? He waiting on God to come save him. Yeah. I think he slept like a baby. Yeah, so, he here's why I think he slept like a baby. First of all, look at examples he laid down. Y'all remember the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on the mount and uh, Moses and Elijah, or even Moses and Enoch, one of them, appeared to Jesus uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration and Peter fell asleep. Uh, you remember the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus said, y'all, please stay awake, but he kept falling asleep. They prayed, he kept falling asleep. And there was other instances where Peter would fall asleep. He slept like a baby. Here's another reason why I think Peter slept like a baby that very last night with two guards chained to him. Because Peter knew he was not going to die the next day. He knew he wasn't going to die the next day because Jesus had gave him a promise. And he remembered that promise. In John 21, verses 17 and 18, now this here promise was given to him just two to three months before this is that we're talking about tonight. So it had just been given to him months before, uh, right before Jesus went to the cross. But listen to this promise that Jesus gave to Peter. Jesus said, Feed my sheep, fairly truly. Listen to me. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But... When you are old, listen to that word, old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death which Peter would glorify God. When you are old, someone else will stretch out your hand. Peter remembered that promise. Peter wasn't old. He was young here. Jesus said, when you were old, the stretching of the hand, 
Peter ended up being crucified. That was his uh, means of death. But he said, do not crucify me in the manner of my Lord. This is in historical books. Uh, the, uh, the Jewish uh, historian uh, Josephus, who worked for the Roman government, records a lot of this stuff in his writings. He said, do not uh, hang, uh, crucify me in the manner of my Lord. Hang me upside down. And that they did. And there's some writings that say not only did they hang him upside down, but they lit him on fire as well. So, Jesus had told him, when you were old, this is how you're going to die. Peter wasn't old here. Peter remembered that promise. This is, I mean, you've got to tie all the scripture together. I think Peter slept like a baby, just smiling, knowing he wasn't going to get to die the next day. He knew somehow, some way, God was going to rescue him because he had not finished his testimony yet. Simple as that. He had not finished his testimony yet. It says here that they were waiting on this festival of unleavened bread to pass by before they put Peter on trial. Do you know it was the Jewish law that, well, actually, <clears throat> capital punishment had been taken away from the Jews. The Romans did capital punishment at this point. But they, they did recognize the law. It was against the law to uh, kill someone, you know, by beheading or crucifixion on a major festival, one of the major festivals. You couldn't do it during that time. You had to wait after it was over with or do it before. But then you think it in your mind, well, Jesus was killed on Passover. He was crucified on Passover. But he had to be crucified on Passover to fulfill prophecy. He had to be that Passover lamb that was prophesied all through the Old Testament. So, he was crucified on Passover, but it was highly illegal. <coughs> but they kind of did it in secret anyway, if you remember. They, they tried him in secret and uh, took him out and uh, put him on the cross. But he had to be done on Passover because it had to fulfill the prophecy that was prophesied about him. Let's read a little further. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying for God uh, to God for him. The church was earnestly praying to God for him. That word earnestly praying, the church. You know, it's kind of sad that the church has to wait till something is majorly wrong before they earnestly pray. Instead of earnestly praying all the time. They did it back in that day. I think to an extent it's still, we're still guilty of it today. The earnest they pray. Um, they're, you know, we pray and pray and I think sometimes we pray out of habit but earnestly pray is serious prayer. That's the believers together. Uh, often on their face pray. That's something that we need to think about and maybe learn to apply to, to our lives that earnest prayer. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping, there's the word, he was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Like I said, there had been four guarding at the time, six hour shifts. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Peter must have been sleeping hard because when the angel appeared, this big light shone. Remember me sharing with y'all about the bright light? The bright light shone, it didn't even wake Peter up. If somebody flips a light on my bedroom and I'm sleeping, boom, I'm up with my hand on my pistol. Right <coughs> he had to be sleeping hard. It says that even the angel had to strike him to wake him up. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off of Peter's wrist. 
Then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing, was doing, was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left Peter. I want to ask you a question, and be honest with me. Did you think in your heart and in your mind that that story I just read actually happened just like it says it happened? Or do you think that's some sort of symbolic writing just saying somehow Peter got released from prison? Be honest. I think it happened. I think it happened. I think it happened just like it said it happened. Does everybody in here believe this story happened exactly as it says it happened? Huh? No doubts. No worries. Good. Because it did. It happened just like it said it happened. If, if, if we don't believe it happened as it says it happened, we, you would have too many questions to even believe about it. You have to believe it to believe it. Amen, brother. Amen. Follow up. you got to believe it. There's a lot of symbolic imagery and writing in the book of Revelation, but not in the book of Acts. Solid facts, just like it says it happened. An angel, pray, earnest prayer fetched an angel. An angel fetched Peter. Simple as that. The earnest prayer fetched the angel from heaven, and the angel fetched Peter from prison. That's what earnest prayer will do. Here's the next question. Do you believe in your heart and in your mind that that can happen these days and times if God chooses to do so? Yes. 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 Good. Because it can. God's a sovereign Lord. He can do what He wants to do when He wants to do it. And if we don't believe that, our faith is weak. We must maintain strong faith and believe in miracles. Believe in supernatural things that cannot be explained by scientists. Uh, believe in supernatural things that cannot be explained by reasonable logic, uh, by the study of science, by the Big Bang Theory, by any other means other than it's God's sovereign choice to do so. God still performs miracles today. We might not see Him as much as other people, but there is amazing things happening in third world countries. I got witness to this. Let's pray for him right now. Father Lord, we come to you uh, lifting up Brother Ken. He's sick of his stomach right now. Please help him, Father. Please help him with his nausea. We'll leave him with the nausea, Father. He has been sick here a lot lately. We just ask you to touch him in a special way, Father. Our prayer, Father, we expect you to fetch an angel to fetch him out of sickness. Please, Lord, help him. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's move on. We have to believe that things that I've been told about uh, things that's happened in third world countries, lepers are being healed right in front of people's eyes. Uh, Brother Eddie knows somebody that saw a arm, a limb suddenly appear on a man right in front of their eyes. There's still miracles happening today in certain places of the world where faith is strong, where People don't have as much as we have where they pray for every meal they receive. They pray for every safe day they live. Strong faith. Strong faith makes a difference. Let's see about the church. Verse 11. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now, I know without a doubt the Lord has sent his angel to rescue me 
compare its clutches and everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. See, Herod was wanting to kill these apostles in front of the, Ju the Judaizers, the Jewish people who were still practicing uh, Judaism, because it made them happy. They were wanting to rid the world of Christianity. So by killing these uh, apostles, the followers of Jesus, but that made them very happy. That's why he killed James and had plans to kill uh, uh, Peter the next day. Verse 12. When this had dawned on him, <laughs> Peter, it took him a minute to realize it. He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered their prey. Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant named Rhonda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was overjoyed. She ran back without opening it <laughs> and explained, Peter's at the door. Can you, can you picture this in your mind? The church is inside, earnestly praying, just praying, praying, uh, on her face, praying, and all of a sudden, Peter knocks at the door. Rhonda goes over to the door, and Peter says, Hey, it's me, Peter. Now, she heard Peter, and she knew it was Peter, and I think it's pretty much said she believed it was Peter. But she was so excited, she didn't let him in. She ran back to tell the others. This is the part that amazes me. The church is earnestly praying, but when they get the answer to their prayer, they're in doubt. They're in doubt. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. They were praying for Peter's release. And God answered that prayer. And we're fixing to talk about the answer of prayer in just a minute. God answered the prayer. Release, release got Peter out of prison. But yet, they doubted the answer. They did not expect it to happen, even though they were earnestly praying. You know, I expected the early church to have deeper faith than that for some reason, you would think. You know, after what they had seen, after the miracles they had seen, they had seen the apostles doing miracles, and yet, for some reason, they doubted that that was even Peter at the door. Well, let's talk about God answering prayer. A lot of times, we pray for someone who's very sick. And it's our carnal nature to pray for complete healing in their lives. Bring them back to us. You know, Lord, stay on earth. Please, Lord, heal them and bring them back. And when we don't get the answer we want, we think God didn't hear our prayer. Let me tell you something. God answers every prayer. Every prayer, He answers it. Sometimes He says yes, and sometimes He says no. The last time I checked, no was, the answer, was an answer. Yes and no. Sometimes He says no because the person we're praying for has finished their testimony and it's time for them to go home to heaven and be in a such greater place than we're in, but we're praying for them to stay on this evil earth that we live in. It's, it's, it's natural. It's our carnal nature. We love them. We want them to stay around us. But think about it. God answers every prayer one way or the other. And we need to learn to accept those answers and be full of faith that God when you don't answer it the way we expect it, it is so much better for that person. So much better. And not only that, we're promised that we're not out of touch with that person forever. We're going to see them, and some of us before we know it, some of us sooner than others, we're going to see that person again. You know, are you okay? Yeah, I'm just going to all the time. I appreciate it starting out here. That's okay. We pray for you. Um, we're talking about God's answer to prayer. When 
we don't get the answer we expect, we think God did not hear our prayer and did not answer it. But God's got two answers to prayer. He's got yes and he's got no. And when he says no, it's for the glory of him. It's for the betterment of the kingdom. And we have to understand that. We have to accept that. And it's always better. We, we live and we, we are a testimony to the world for everything we do is for the betterment of the kingdom good. It's for kingdom good. Not necessarily for our good or our worldly good. Everything that we do and say and uh, all our testimonies and the good deeds we do are always for kingdom good. You must be out of your mind, they told her. And she kept insisting it was so. And they said it must be an angel. A little disappointed with the church. Weak faith. Didn't pray, earnestly praying. Here's Peter. God said yes to that, that prayer. Here he is, right? Do you think they prayed for James the same way they prayed for Peter? No. Yes, they did too. Yes, they did too. They earnestly prayed for James as well, but God said no to that prayer. But he said yes to the prayer of Jesus. It still got answered. It just got answered in it with a no. They prayed the same for James as they did for Peter. Earnestly prayed. It's not recorded, but you can bet that they did. But Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. They were astonished. <laughs> Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet. Yeah, I bet they were in the uproar when they saw Peter there, knowing he had been chained to guards, and described how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Tell James, now this is another James. Peter's well aware that James, the brother of John, has been murdered. He's saying now, tell James, the half-brother of Jesus, this James, the half-brother of Jesus, and the other brothers and sisters about this. He said, and then he left for another place. I often wonder, why did he leave for another place? Why did he stay right here with the church? Did you ever remember that? He started another church. Pardon? He may have been going somewhere to start another church. I think he did it for a couple of reasons. I think he did it because he knew they were probably going to come look at it eventually. And he didn't want to draw attention to where they were kind of underground and hiding out, worshiping and praying. He did it for that reason. And also, I don't think he ever slowed down being a witness. I don't think he ever slowed down sharing the gospel. I think he just woke up. He was fresh. Uh, I had to be early morning hours. I think he went straight out and started preaching the gospel again. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers. <clears throat> As to what had become of Peter. And Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him. He cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. That was the role of the guard. Did not do his duty right? Boom, you're dead. He killed 16 guards over this instance right here. Herod was evil. Uh, the poor guards, they, they probably just didn't know what I'm trying to What happened? The world did he get off his chains? You know? I just pray that they saw it was a miracle. Maybe some of them accepted Jesus before he got killed. But it had to say something happened, some sort of miracle. But yeah, he put 16 of them to death over his. Well, I got time to talk about Herod's death. I didn't even hear anyway. <clears throat> then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they now joined together and saw an audience with him. After securing the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace. Because they depended on the king's country for the food supply. So these people that uh, is about to uh, praise him as a god depended on him for their food. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. Let me tell you about these royal robes. Uh, 
It says in the writings of Josephus that this robe that he wore on this particular day was a robe of silver foil, solid silver foil made into a robe. So when he stepped out into the sun, it just gleamed and glistened. Gleamed. So you got a picture in here uh, gleaming and glistening and uh, shining and just showing off, you know, looking good. They shouted. This is the voice of a God, not a man. Now these are the people shouting this that depend on Him for their food. And He's sitting here in this water made out of silver foil, shining and gleaming and speaking loud. A voice of a God, not a man. Oh man, they lifted Him up as a God. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. Immediately, because he did not rebuke them, and this is also in the writings of Josephus, uh, they did, because he did not rebuke or reject their flattery, he was struck by worms and died. Uh, Josephus said he was in terrible pain and suffered for five days before he died. And what killed him was a tapeworm. Uh, all around the sheep and the cattle country, these tapeworms were real bad back in the day. They would attach yourself to the liver, and these great big old boils would come, cysts would come on the liver. And eventually it would get so big it would burst, and all that poison would go through the body. This is what killed him. Kind of like staff. Yeah, they would get stabbed, and they had no ways of treating it back in them days, and it would kill him. But he suffered with this mess for five solid days before he finally died. If he would have uh, rebuked these people and said, oh, no, 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 don't, don't praise me as no God, I'm merely a man, like Paul did, like some of the other apostles did, when they were trying to be praised by other people, as God's, they said, no, no, don't do that. I'm merely a man. If he would have just done that, he would have been fine. But no, he's evil. He's big-headed. Uh, and he probably thought he's just a God. You know, he really did. He probably thought he was a God. And God killed him. I was, I was struck him right then. Uh, it sounds like he died right away, but he didn't. Before the Josephus' memos, he, he suffered for five solid days and died. But, 24, the Word of God continued to spread and flourish. Remember what Jesus said? On this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Nothing they did could do away with the church. The church just kept growing and growing, going deeper and deeper into the world. The Ethiopian took it way into Africa. The gospel was spread just like he said in uh, the first chapter we read in uh, Acts verse 8. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and then to the very ends of the earth. It's happening just like Jesus said it would. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's recorded for us and that we can learn, Father, and live as they did. Help us to be strong in our faith, Father, to be a church with earnest prayer and be a church with very, very strong faith. Help us to go out Father, and share what we've learned with other people. Father. We have the gospel written on our hearts and on our minds and we've accepted you as our Lord and Savior. Use us. Use us in a mighty way to love your kingdom. Keep us safe as we leave this place, Father, and go to our homes. And, uh, I just pray a special blessing upon all people here today. I pray a, a special prayer for Ken with what he's going through with his stomach and his nausea. We lift him up again to you, Father, and ask for answers. We just ask you to work through uh, a miracle, Father, if that's what you choose to do. But if you say no to that, let the doctors and the nurses be your miracle. Let them uh, figure out what's wrong and get him on the right medication so that he'll feel better. In Christ in my name, amen.